So in this video, we're going to see some more advanced prolog examples that will take into consideration a lot of the different techniques that we've talked about so far with prolog. So our first example, we're going to write a rule called split list. So split list is going to split this list into values less than seven and values greater than seven. So here's a representation of our list. Split list is going to break that into two pieces. The first, the elements less than seven. The second, the elements greater than seven. This particular query would return the list X is equal to 2463513 and Y would be equal to the list 3, 18, 11, 19, and 7. So our base case, when we write our split list rule, regardless of what the number is, if we're given an empty list, we're going to split that into two empty lists because there's nothing really left to do. And I'll put a cut here because that's a base case. And when we reach this case, there's nothing else to do. We're going to have two additional rules that are going to handle the two possible cases. The first is we're given some n and we have a list and we'll come back and figure out what to put for these two lists in a moment. So our first case, what if h is less than n? Well, I'll put a cut here because again, if it's less than n, there's only one thing we're going to do and that is we're going to put it in the first list. So it's going to be the head of the small result. I'm not quite done yet though because I need to still split the rest of the list. So I'm going to split list with n, the tail, because again, I pulled the head off the tail and put it back on where it goes. And then I'm going to split this into the smaller and larger lists. And I'll take out that space. So this is what I'm going to do if the head of the list is less than n. I'm going to put it on the smaller list. There's my smaller list and there's my larger list. Let me copy this rule. However, now I only get to this rule if h is greater than or equal to n because I have a cut in the rule above it. So there's no way for us to reach this rule unless h is greater than n. Well, if h is greater than n, we're not going to put it on the smaller list. We're going to put it in front of the larger list because that's where it belongs. So I'll clean this up. So let's consult this. And let's split list. 10, and we'll split that into small and large, and you can see this does the split for us. And if I try this, if I do it correctly, then if I split it zero, it gives me the entire list. And if I split this at, let's say seven, notice now all the values are less than seven. So my small list has all the values that are in the original list and the larger list has nothing because nothing's greater than seven. So this seems to work pretty well. And this is a technique that we'll use in a lot of cases. If you're appending this way, or if you're sorting or doing anything where you're taking some list and processing it, especially if you want to split it into two pieces, then this is a good way to do that. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to implement the quicksort algorithm. So if you remember from CSC 205 in quicksort, what you do is you select a value and then you pivot around that value. You separate the values in your list into a list of the values smaller and then the values larger, which kind of sounds like what we just did. Then you recursively quick sort each piece. Then you combine the two pieces together. So in this case, for our implementation, we're always going to pick the first value to be our pivot. Now there's reasons not to do this. This actually can cause trouble in some cases, but those are beyond the scope of, of this class. So if you were ever going to actually use this to sort things, you would want to be a little more careful with how you choose your pivot. But for our purposes, it simplifies our implementation. And so we're going to go in and just do that. So then if I pivot around seven, I'm going to generate two lists, one with values less than seven, one with values greater than or equal to seven. Then I'm going to recursively sort those. And now they're sorted. Then I need to recombine these. Well, seven is in between the lists. So first I'm going to put seven at the beginning of the larger list. Then I'm going to append the two lists and that gives me a sorted list. So let's see how that works in code. So the easiest case is if I have a empty list, then that is trivially sorted. Now, if I don't have an empty list, then I'm going to take the first element as my pivot value. And then I'm going to have the rest of the values in the tail. And I'm going to put those into a sorted list. Now I have my pivot, I have the rest of the list, and what I need to do is to partition those two lists. And it turns out that split list does exactly what I need the partition to do. So I'm actually just gonna call split list 
with the pivot value, and that's going to give me my left and right partitions. If I wanted to call a method with the correct name, right, this is called partition if we're implementing quicksort, I could change the name of this, of this to partition, or I could write a partition rule that just called split list. But for now, I think I'll just leave it at split list. And I'll put a comment here that we're partitioning. So now I have my partitions. So I'm going to quicksort those partitions. Okay, so now I have two sorted lists, the values less than the pivot, the values greater than the pivot. So I need to put those together. And I'm going to append the left sorted with the right sorted. However, I need to put the pivot back onto that. So this takes the right sorted list and puts the pivot in front. Remember, this gives us a list that way. And again, if I did this on left sorted, I would need to do an, another append. So doing it this way is a lot simpler because by putting the head in front of a list, that gives me a list. If I put a list in front of just the head, then I would get a pair, and that's not what I want. So this is how I want this to work. And then when I pin those together, that's going to give me my sorted list. So let's consult. Now let's quick sort. One, two three, two, one. So it looks like I didn't save my file. There we go. It looks like that's sorted. And there we go, sorting a longer list. And again, eventually remember, SWI will give up printing values, but you can tell that it put the smaller values in the front. And so we can assume that that's uh, the rest of this list is sorted. And if you had doubts, you could write a rule that would check to see if something is sorted. Now, suppose we want to check that our list only contains unique elements, meaning there's no repeats. So I'm going to make a predicate that's going to take one parameter, a list. It's going to succeed or fail based on whether or not there are no duplicates in the list. So if I have an empty list, then everything in there is unique. If I have one thing in that list, no matter what it is, so I'll make it anonymous, it's unique. Then if I have some head, and I'm actually going to look at the first two elements here, and you'll see why in a moment. So this is going to be unique, first off, if the head and hx are not the same value. So I'm going to tell Prolog that I don't want to unify h and hx. So this will fail if h and hx unify to the same value. And if they do, I'm done, and there's nothing more to do, so I'll put a cut here. Then I want to make sure that h is unique in the tail so let's check this and see if it works so we'll say unique one two three two one and that's false so that's good what about one two three that's true so that's good what about one one two three that's false how about one two three three that's true that's odd what about one, two, two, three? And that also succeeds. So the reason for this is because we're pulling two elements off here to look at. So I can fix that in a couple of different ways. But what I'm going to do is I'm also going to insist then that HX put back on T is unique. What adding this extra rule is, is it's going to make sure that both of these are unique. Since I'm taking both of them off, I need to verify that both of them are unique in the list. So this catches the first pair, but as we move through the list, we can have cases where this is a two, this is a three. Well, the three appears later in the list, so I need to check that for uniqueness as well. This will do that for us, and that should be sufficient now to catch all of the cases that we talked about. So now that's failing. Now one, two, three, three should fail. And then let's try one, two, three to be sure that it does actually work. So this is just a case where using the non-unification operator can make things helpful. Let's see another case. So suppose we want to come up with a lunch duty assignment and we're going to assume that we're only going to do this for Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So we're going to have a list. Monday is going to have two teachers, A and B. Wednesday and actually, just to save space, let me abbreviate the days. We'll have teachers C and D. And notice those are variables, whereas the days of the week are atoms. And Friday is busy, so we're going to have E, F, and G as our 
lunch duty teachers. And we're going to expect the user to pass us a list of teachers. Okay, so what we're going to do with this rule is we're going to insist that A is a member of teachers, B, C, D, E, F, and G are all members of teachers. And for now, let's just stop here and see how that works. So let's consult. And let's say that we have some teachers. So we're going to say, here's the schedule. And our teachers are going to be Judy, Leon, Greg, Jill, Kent, Susan, Mike, and Wade. So here's the schedule. Now, the good news about this schedule is we have eight teachers and seven of them are very happy with this schedule. The problem with the schedule is Judy is going to be extremely unhappy with the schedule. So what are we going to do to fix this? Well, we could keep looking for additional schedules, but as you can see, it's going to take a while before we cycle through and get this to where we want it to be. So one of the things we could do is say each teacher can only have one lunch duty assignment per week. And guess how we can do that? We can say that the list of teachers is unique. And now, when we assign lunch duty notice, we get unique values for each assignment. Now, if I reject this, notice it's going to start generating valid results. And it'll keep doing that until I'll get every possible valid assignment where no one gets more than one assignment. Now, suppose there's some other constraints. So let's suppose that Kent can't have lunch duty on Wednesday. So we could say that C can't unify with Kent, D can't unify with Kent as well. Just to make sure that we're, we're failing those, let's say that Susan can't do Friday. And there's cleaner ways to do this. We could write rules to do this, but for now I'll just brute force this. And I better spell Susan's name right or else it's not going to work. And, and remember before, Susan was assigned Friday. So now let's consult. And now in our first result, notice Susan isn't here at all. So what we've done is we've generated possible assignments. Then we've added some constraints to say that all of these variables have to be unified with a unique name. And then we've also further said that, hey, I don't want Kent to have duty on Wednesday and Susan not to have duty on Friday. And I could keep adding as many constraints as I wanted, but then ultimately, if there is a valid solution, Prolog will find it. And I can keep adding additional things to say, okay, this person wants to do Monday. So let's say if one of these resolves to Greg, then we could say something like, well, then it has to be either C or D. Greg only works on Wednesday or, or something like that. There's no limit to the things here. So here's a few more advanced examples with Prolog. Hopefully it gives you some ideas for the kind of things that Prolog can do.